Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the latest webinar in our series, which is titled How to Talk about Talk to Your Line Manager About Your Mental Health from for the First Time. And today we've got a truly inspiring webinar for you. Um, but I just want to start with some introductions uh, for everybody. Firstly, my name is Katie. I'm the Director of Strategy and Partnerships at Mental Health UK. We're one of the UK's leading charities when it comes to workplace mental health. I'm going to introduce each of um, our guest speakers today for you um, now. So firstly, if I can introduce Nuet Yip. Nuet is joining us from Lloyds Banking Group. Good morning. How are you doing today? Good morning, Katie. Very good. Thank you very much. And hope you are too. Fabulous. Yeah, all doing really well here. Thank you. Um, and then secondly, I'd like to introduce uh, Nikki Garcher davies who is uh, also joining us from Lloyds Banking Group. Hi, morning, everyone. And then finally, uh, Emma Carrington, who is one of my colleagues at Mental Health UK. Hello there, Katie. Hope everyone's OK today. All good. All good. Thank you. Um, so as I said, it's got a really exciting webinar today. We've got lots of content um, to be going, uh, getting through. So we're going to crack on very shortly. But before we get started, um, just want to do this sort of regular housekeeping. Um, we are recording today's session. So if you want to listen back, um, please do so. We will send the link around to everybody who's attending the session today um, a little bit later on this afternoon. Um, and please do share this webinar as well. That's going to be one of the call to actions that we leave with you at the very end. Um, secondly, there is a chat function and also there is a Q&A function. And we're going to protect a bit of time at the end of today's webinar for you to ask any of us um, who are taking part today any questions um, that you like. And uh, Look forward to look forward to hearing your your thoughts. Um, and so, with that in mind, uh, I'm going to crack on if that's okay. And um, now, you you've come today to share your story with us, and thank you very much uh, for doing that. Sometimes these things aren't the easiest to talk about. So, I'm actually just going to hand over to you for a few minutes to to start where you want to start and, and tell us tell us your story. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, I think for me. The whole thing that I, the reason why I want to do this because I feel like I have been on a bit of a journey sort of like over the last 18 months and I really felt like I had more downs than than ups and you know if we take it back to the first lockdown and probably like everybody else like you know the novelty of working from home and then having to homeschool that really faded really quickly and then I was really tormented you know by trying to be sort of like this 100% mum and wife and then trying to deliver you know 100% at work and then I've got this new role thrown upon me with a teacher you know admittedly I wasn't very good at and then you know everything was done and the corner of the kitchen was the office um but it was also where the kids you know were doing their work it's also where I cook and where we eat as a family so you know when I look back at it now I was literally spending more than sort of like 12 hours a day in this one place and in this little room but and I knew it wasn't healthy but I just felt like at that time like I had no choice I was also working really late and um, trying to make up for the lost time at work and you know hoping that the lockdown would end really soon so we could all go back to some sort of normality um and I think it was back in the July time when I knew that I'd reached that point where I just couldn't do anything anymore from I just couldn't continue with the pace that I was and I was actually turned into a no person even to like you know my kids that mean the world to me um and I was literally you know having a go at them for coming to the kitchen even if they wanted a drink I'd throw them the look and you know and they'll quickly like scatter out and you know it's not something I was proud of but I think at the time I was just all over the place um and literally like one morning um I was sat like at the kitchen table and I was ready to log on and I just couldn't face turning on that laptop I couldn't push the button so I called um my line manager at the time and I literally just broke down um I then had four weeks um off work and that you know by having that time off work I felt like the pressure did come off a little bit um and in that time I realized that it was okay that we didn't have to do or complete like you know the the school work that was set the house it's okay that it isn't perfect and the toys and clothes are everywhere and it's okay to like you know feel the way that I did at the time and um, so after the four weeks I felt really refreshed and 
I came back with a really, really clear mindset and um, I had some, some really great challenges at work. And it was also in that time that I met Nikki um, and she joined as our head of our department. And, you know, we had an, an initial call and straight away, you know, Nikki had all this sort of like the, the, the positive vibes and this this energy and, you know, started sharing like her own personal experiences and how it shapes who she is today and that she's passionate sort of about colleague and, you know, mental well-being. And that made me feel really comfortable. And it was at that point as well, you know, she asked if there's anything I wanted to, to, to let her know or anything. And, you know, I then decided that, you know, I felt comfortable to tell her that I'd actually had four weeks off work and the reasons why I had it. And she was really understanding and I didn't feel judged. And when the call ended, I actually felt like, whoa, that, that was easy. Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, she, that, that's, that's a really good feeling to have. Um, and then earlier this year, um, I sadly lost um, my father and that hit me really, really hard. Um, I was devastated, heartbroken, and I felt really lost and I eventually got a doctor's appointment and he suggested like a, lo a local um, mental health like community group and I signed up to that and eventually they suggested that I'd go back to the doctors um, because I thought that I might have needed like a little bit more sort of like one-to-one -one support um, and so I reached out to um, Validium as well so an employee support sort of like network and through that um, I met my um, my counsellor um, Wendy and I think at the time um, I didn't understand like the concept of counselling and even in that first session I was really really like you know defensive and challenging her like you know saying how can you help me you've got no idea like what I'm feeling, what I'm going through. You don't even know me as a, like an individual. Um, and, you know, the call ended um, with, I felt really positive. I really felt like I released all this frustration and guilt and pain, whatever. It, I felt like after that first session, it all ended. And I, I started to really accept sort of like the, the, the purpose and why Wendy was trying to help me and that impartial voice. But I think what really provoked me was the fact that when she questioned me it made me see things and you know send things in a totally different way um and it was also during that time that Nikki dropped me a message um telling me that she knew that it was tough right now um and not to rush back into anything and that I've got her full support and honestly those couple of lines meant the world to me um and it just meant that I could focus on me and my family um so eventually I ended up with um I was off work for probably just over eight weeks and um I realized I, I wanted to try and get back um and um I, I got in touch with work and let them know that I wanted to try and come back so we agreed logistics and even on my first day of coming back, I had, you know, a call with Nikki um, and, you know, she was telling me how glad she was to have me back, reassuring me um, and that we all deal with things differently. Um, and at that point, I felt really valued and treated like an individual. Um, and because of how she made me feel, I, it was also then that I thought I could tell her that I was having counseling sessions as well and because it was all new to me I, I did find it quite difficult to kind of admit that I was having these sessions um but straight away like you know Nikki totally understood sort of like where I was coming from and you know and it turned to the point where she was well you know just tell me what you need and you know I started saying so for example things like well I'm gonna have to need an hour off each week to have like my counseling session and depending on how I feel following you know the session I might be offline you know for for a little bit afterwards and she was absolutely fine with that and I, I guess where I am today is is probably because I had all of the understanding and 
you know, support from home, from Wendy, um, Nikki and, you know, my, my teammates and work. And I definitely feel a lot stronger, sort of like mentally and emotionally. And um, that I've learned even a lot about myself in terms of like how I think, you know, process and, you know, reacting to things and actually realising how far I've come and how much I have changed, you know, over the last 18 months. Um, but the reason why I'm doing this as well is because I want people to know how important it is to share how you feel um, in order just to get the right level of support and that, like, literally you're not on your own. Well, listen, thank you first, Senior, for, for, for sharing that, that with us. What you probably haven't seen just yet, but it's there if you want to have a look, look through, is the amount of sort of love and support that has flooded into you already on the uh, on the chat function today because we've we've had this conversation already er earlier on this week and I know it was tough for you then and I think you've um, you'd have just done yourself, you know, an absolute testament in sharing with us in the way that you have just there. Um, now, obviously, today we're talking about the support from line managers, and I guess, Nikki, this is where we begin to introduce you, because that's the role that you you played in this story. And I guess sort of, you know, hearing this back um, now, how do you think UX doing? Amazing. Um, I, I also am doing everything that I can to hold back emotion, because every time I speak to Nuet, and we, every time I hear her story, there's new snippets of her emotions and what she's been through that, that I learn as well. Um, she's amazing. She's absolutely amazing. And I'm so proud that she's able to come here today and share her story in a way, because when I met Nuet just over 12 months ago, she's always, you know, Nuet, you've always been an, an amazing character. You know, I, I connected so well with you as I did with the whole team when I joined just this lovely authenticity about you you know and, and vulnerability about you which you you're not afraid to share but when I first met you 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 felt very guilty for that vulnerability um you know and it, it was almost kind of you see this a lot with people don't you you know you you share emotion but then you apologize for feeling that way um or you you kind of say that I know that I probably shouldn't be saying this I know I shouldn't be doing this and over the course of this this kind of journey that that Nuet's been on with so much stuff happened to her that you know a lot of people can resonate with and I can see people are saying that in the chat it's the the power that she's created within herself to put herself first and be okay with not being okay that I am the most proud of um she's she is an amazing individual. There's no doubt about that. You know, the, you guys can see how electric she is every time she speaks. But fundamentally, we can't underestimate the journey that, that she's been on. You know, you, you, I, I also lost my father. And I think that's one of the things that we connected with when we first when we first spoke. Nuet said that I shared part of my life and my vulnerabilities with her because that's something that I don't think any of us should should kind of feel embarrassed about. And it's why I'm so passionate about, you know, mental health and, and us having conversations like we're having today. But actually, what Nuet hasn't mentioned is every single time we talked about things, counselling, losing her father, I had shared experiences that meant our conversations became so easy. We, it's not about approaching your line manager to to kind of open yourself up and put yourself on the line. It's about finding connection. And that's, that can be really easy to do if you kind of go into that conversation with no expectation. I know that every time I speak to Nuet or anybody else in Lloyd's Banking Group, I have no expectation of what they're about to tell me or what I'm about to share as well, because it's that openness of a conversation that I think really helps people. And, and that's what makes you feel supported and comforted as well. But I think she's doing absolutely amazing um you know it's a day by day process and even though right now we're not working together we're still very much connected um you know because i'm just proud to see how she's how she's accessing the resources that she needs absolutely absolutely and you've started to touch on there um you know some of your motivators and your drivers uh to to want to to want to help you and i, I guess that's something that i'd like to understand a little bit more and you know from your perspective what is it that, what is it that you did how was it that you supported in this situation 
Um, I think, to be honest, um, Katie, the, the, the biggest concept that's out there with a traditional colleague line manager conversation is probably one built on hierarchy. And it's built on a construct where you are approaching somebody for their, for their permission to help you feel OK. And that's something that I fundamentally just don't believe in anyway. As human beings, we are all equal. I come from a culture where that is an ethos that I strongly, strongly believe in. And ultimately, I think that's where I was able to help Nuet was I didn't look at her as somebody who was working for me in my in my wider team. She's a human being and every single person that I speak to, it's, it's just about having a, a genuine conversation with another human being and having that level of connection where if you meet a friend down the pub, you know, and you're introduced to somebody, you, you authentically connect with people, you connect with them. There's nothing, there's nothing that doesn't allow us to do that in a work capacity. It's just we've built these constructs around us in a traditional working environment that actually says we need to make sure that we're all working within the parameters and the, the kind of ring fenced worlds of I'm a manager, I'm a colleague, I am et cetera, et cetera. And actually, when it comes to our health and it comes to our well-being, none of that applies. It, it doesn't apply. And actually, in a lot of work situations, it shouldn't apply either. But I won't go down that road. But it's literally kind of when you think about from a, a well-being perspective, we're all human beings that, that are able to support each other. And there are accesses, there are these shared experiences that fundamentally help us have the right level of conversation. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and I can see from the chat here that a lot of people are, are agreeing with you that, you know, this, this, is, this shouldn't be a conversation about hierarchy. This is, this is about stripping us back and understanding us as individuals for who we are as, as, as human beings. Um, and so, I wanted to, to ask you, um, in amongst all of this, what was it that made you feel safe in speaking to, to Nikki and speaking to your line manager about how it was that you were feeling? I think um, based on sort of like the experiences that I've had, I think it got to a point where I think I'd recognise what I needed. Um, so coming from that space and that that place is is to get that message across to to obviously Nikki and to my um, my line manager at the time. Um, but I think what made it really easy, well, it certainly felt very easy, was the fact that just you know going back to what Nikki was saying that I didn't feel like there were any barriers um you know I was being treated like as an individual and you know the Nikki understood where I was coming from the place I was at and she was able to inspire me to open up and to tell her like what I needed and not ask for didn't feel like I needed to ask for that permission absolutely and 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 Emma so You've been working with people to support them with their mental health for, for quite some time now, including in the workplace. How, how familiar is, is this story? Um, and what are the key takeaways for you that are easy and straightforward for other people to, to, to take on? Yeah, I think it, it's so inspiring to, to hear people like Nia and Nikki talking about like, their experiences. Um, I think the, the biggest thing, and, and I feel like I'm just echoing what Nikki said, is, is really recognising that, you know, this is a human to human moment. You know, when someone's coming to you and showing their vulnerability, you you throw that um, hierarchy out of out of the out of the window. You know, it's it's about listening to that person. Um I think that there are a lot of people, certainly from um, roles that I've done in the past, I, I know that um, some people don't have successful conversations like this with their line managers and they're really scared and worried about having that conversation. Um, and, and I just hope that, you know, um, having line managers on this call and listening can, can really help. Um, listening is an absolute key skill for line managers. And I think that we often think that listening is, you know, we all do it every day. It's really easy. And it's one of the hardest skills to do, to just zip that mouth and listen and actively listen, really listening to that person in front of you. One of the best pieces of advice I got when I became a line manager was if a colleague comes up to you, this was back in the days pre-pandemic, um, a colleague would come up to you, you 
turn away from your computer screen and you look at them and they get 100% of your conversation. Um, obviously, if you're having a conversation um, like this, then, you know, you want to be going to somewhere private to, to be able to have that kind of confidential conversation. But I think even in, um, you know, in the pandemic world, we've probably all sat on um, meetings with somebody where they've been having, and you can see it, they've been having emails pop up or Teams messages and their eyes flick down. And if you're trying to have a conversation like this with somebody, that makes you feel not listened to. Um, so if somebody's coming to you with a conversation like this, do you know what? Put your Teams to do not disturb, turn your outlook off and just listen to that person. I'm not sure if that answered your question, Katie. You know what I'm like, I get passionate and go off about things. <laughs> I, think, I, think that's, I think that's probably what everybody's enjoying from, from listening to this. <laughs> but you're, you're right that that, that um, fundamental skill of listening is, is incredibly difficult. You know, even sitting here listening to you now, I'm thinking about you know, where we go next with the conversation and how I want to respond to that. But to actually just mm. actively listen, um, you know, it really is a challenge. Um, and I just think actually what, one of the observations um, that I've had here, and I know a couple of other people have too, is that we're an all-female panel today, which which hasn't happened all that often. Um, and, and I wondered if you could sort of talk to us about, you know, sort of some of the differences that men and women have when it comes to talking about mental health and, um, you know, what the prevalence is. Uh, yeah. And yeah. And yeah, I mean, we, we know that men are less likely to talk about their mental um, health and well-being. And I mean, there are many reasons for that. But, you know, obviously the kind of societal pressures that are placed on men to be strong and to not show weakness and things. Um, and that kind of stops men coming forward a lot of the time. We can see this in things like, um, you know, when we look at the number of patients that use kind of first line NHS talking therapy services, um, we know that only 36% of those people are men. Um, so they're less likely to be, um, uh, less likely to be kind of accessing those things. And the thing with um, men as well is that they're more likely to um, turn to kind of harmful coping mechanisms like alcohol and drug use, which then as I think somebody has just said in the chat, does have an impact on on the suicide rate. Um, you know, 75 percent of UK um, deaths from suicide are men. Um, and, I, you know, I just I genuinely believe that if men can talk more openly about their mental health and well-being, then that number will will come down. Um, kind of anecdotally from some work that I'm doing at the moment. So I'm working with a corporate client at the moment and we're providing interventions to support their colleagues' well-being. Um, and one of those interventions is like a helpline for when the colleagues are affected by, you know, the work affects their mental well-being. Um, and actually only 13, one, three percent of the people contacting us are men. Um, so, yeah, men are less likely to, to contact people. So I think that when it comes to men, I think as line managers, we have to sometimes we have to recognise that there's a difference and we have to approach that in a certain way. So I think with men, it's really listening to those things that they're saying in conversations and picking up on them, asking twice about things, um, having a conversation about, you know, what's going on at home. Um, because when you have those conversations and you really listen, you will pick up on things that don't feel quite right and never feel bad about asking about those, you know, being curious about what's going on for somebody, because you might actually start a conversation that ultimately can save somebody's life. And, and, and I think that's going to prove to be one of the key takeaways from today, isn't it, is that, um, you know, it's such a low threshold in terms of the intervention you need to put into place to make potentially make quite a profound uh, difference to, to somebody's life um, and with that in mind and this is a question I'm, I'm going to ask everybody who's on the panel before we um, dive into some of the questions we're getting from the audience which look fantastic by the way um, what would be your best piece of advice first for somebody wanting to talk to their line manager about their mental health and then secondly what would be your one piece of advice for the line manager I'll let you go first, maybe. If, uh... <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so I think from a colleague perspective for me is don't be afraid, um, you know, to, to reach out and 
you know, understand that line managers, you know, they're not mind readers, you know, they can't see and, you know, tell what you're thinking and what you're feeling. So it's really important um, that you, you, you know, that, that you can open up and find that. And I hope that people can find that that point where they can obviously, you know, share what they need to share, you know, with the line managers and get that help that they need. Um, and I think from, you know, what I can say to the line managers is, is reach out to, to your colleagues, you know, and like, you know, the panel was saying is, you know, we're all human. And, you know, the fact that just knowing that, you know, they have your support, it it, is, it means a hell of a lot um, and breaking down those barriers. Absolutely. And, and, and Nikki, the same question, same question to you. I am going to break the rules and give two pieces of advice because they're connected. It is connected. <laughs> Uh, so firstly um build connections as as managers and also as colleagues build connections with everybody that you work with when you come into work you are in a community just like when you're with your friends or your family wherever you are you're part of a community and that community should support you in whatever you're going through in your life good or bad or whatever it should be there to support you and in that way, when you have a community around you, you hopefully never feel alone or you build one or two connections where you feel that that way that you can confide. And that takes me to my second piece of advice for line managers, which is as line managers, don't forget that you are also you have needs. And I want to just share a quick example of something that, that was in mine and Nuet situation when we were having these conversations when you and I first talked and she said I shared some experiences I talked to her about my passion for being a mental health advocate for, for being um, so invested in the mental health agenda and things that have happened in my in my life in my earlier years but actually when you spoke to me earlier this year after losing her father that conversation that we had we've kind of underplayed it today because just of time but we were on the phone for a long time because as she was telling me about losing her father and then reaching out and accessing support I shared with her that I'd lost my father at the age of 13 so I could really empathize with what she was going through I could feel the emotions that she could feel I could literally feel my heart connecting into hers and I was taken back to a 13 year old remembering those, those feelings that I had when I lost my father and that's I think what you know, when Nuet and I were talking about shared ex experience, that's what we had. But then as she started talking about her um, her counselling and reaching out to Wendy, Nuet didn't realise that I was also having counselling and I have had counselling for a long, long time because I had fertility issues and I had I had a fertility journey that, that had been a big part of my life. So the reason I'm sharing that is because as a line manager, I am also vulnerable. I am also having an experience. But what happened in that conversation was a piece of magic because Nuet as a mother then empathized with me and the roles flipped. And that's when you break, completely break all those walls down about the traditional mentality that we have. And that's where that human to human connection comes in. And actually what happened was we ended up talking about how powerful counselling is in, in something I'm going through in my life, something she's going through in her life. And that's the kind of, um, I would say, power and magic that was that has been created. And that's what you have to do when you build connections with people that you're working with is find, and we talk about males, for example, you know, finding connections even with your male colleagues allows you then to know that if that male colleague is particularly passionate about something or, or struggling with something you are then automatically giving yourself as a lever either as a colleague or a line manager to be a support network for them to be a support for a structure for them so that that's what i would that would be my very big one piece of advice broken down in sections <laughs> and, and and it's extremely powerful i really think it is you know in amongst that is just such light, I think, that, that I'm sure many people will, will take away from what they've heard today. Um, and Emma, fine, if I can come over to you and, and then I'm going to dive on some of the questions that we've had from the audience and I'll, I'll ask you the same. Sure. I'm going to try and give kind of a couple of really practical tips. Um, so the first one being, I think, for the person that is um, the colleague that wants to go and speak to the line manager, 
um, write a list, have a list of just notes of things that you want to make sure that you bring up. I'm a big fan of lists when people go to the doctors or anything like that, because whenever we're in a stressful situation, our minds go blank. Um, so just having some notes sometimes of, you know, these are the things that I definitely want to talk about can be really, really helpful. Um, and I'm um, doing Nikki's job now of maybe adding a second little one onto that. Um, I've got a friend at the moment who's going through something um, very similar mental health wise um, and is um, last week actually went to speak to her line manager about that. Um, and she contacted me as like a trusted friend and said, can we just have a little bit of a kind of practice? Um, and I think that can really help just to sit there, first of all, and have that conversation with somebody that you trust. So, um, yeah, you just kind of practice that conversation, I think can really help. From a line manager's perspective, I think that um, as a line manager, we often feel that we need to fix the problems of our of our colleagues. And in this situation, I just think people need to put that to one side for a moment. The fixing will come later, you know, when you start to discuss about, you know, things that might help and support. And, and yeah, just put that to one side and, and really listen to the person, first of all. It's really hard to do that. As line managers, as people that care about um, members of our team or friends, whatever, we often do want to just, you know, wrap them up in cotton wool, get their problems sorted for them and, and, you know, kind of move on. Absolutely don't do that. Listen to them, actively listen. Um, there's a really good um, resource on the Mental Health UK um, website, actually, which is um, a conversation guide to how to have these conversations. And that talks very much about kind of active listening. So um, I'd suggest line managers have a look at that as well. Sounds great. And actually, with that one, Emma, we'll make a point of sending sending the link to the guide round to everybody after we've um, after we've got through today's presentation. Um, so, so many questions here. Uh, we've got we've got a bit of time, which is great. So, I, I'd like to think that we've got time to crack through as many of these as possible. Um, first one, Nikki, uh, for, for yourself. Um, the question is uh, is asking what support you've had from Lloyd's Banking Group as a manager to to, to support new new up. Um, yeah. So. I would probably take the line manager bit out first and then think about what support we had in, in Lloyds Bank for mental health generally. And obviously we, we've got a strategy built around um, role modelling advocates looking after ourselves. And, and I think that whilst we have over two and a half thousand advocates in Lloyds Banking Group, you know, it's something that's kind of disseminated across all colleagues around having access to resources to look after yourself and your own kind of well-being first and then I would play on the line manager kind of piece on top of that and I think that's really important to make that distinction because you can be a great line manager you can do all the things and access all the resources and the Reese's conversation that Emma's just talked about we have access to all of this wonderful stuff both from Mental Health UK and internally lots of courses um, lots of discussions lots of um, webinars like this um, and loads of loads of resources as well but actually you can't really use those to the best of your ability and be a great manager unless you're actually really honest about your own well-being and your own mental health first so that's probably the the kind of um again a piece of advice that i would give is we have a lot of resource in Lloyds banking group to look after ourselves we have free um headspace licenses um we have a, a barrage of access and newet mentioned earlier the, the access to employee assistance program for me personally i have accessed all of those resources for me personally which i think then enabled me as a line manager to advocate and role model those resources and that that support out to colleagues as they needed them it's a, it's a wealth of information um that, that you've got at the you know sort of tips of your fingers there um and and you i wanted to ask you actually just off of the back of that one obviously the relationship that you've built up with nikki has given you the confidence to talk to her but how important was lloyd's banking group's culture around mental health in giving you the confidence to talk it was um it was really important actually because before i'd actually reached out to Nikki and um, we were we'd, we'd launched sort of like within our own internal sort of like response the um, mental health advocates so yeah, back in the um, July time and you know 
before I actually made the phone call to um, my line manager, I actually reached out to um, a, a mental health advocate and it was somebody that I used to work with and it, it was really powerful as well because I think at the time, you know, he made me realise and, you know, feel that I wasn't on my own and I'm not the only one that's doing this and feeling this and, you know, and I'm doing the right thing by, you know, going and, and speaking and letting sort of like my line run, you know, at the time that I needed some additional support. So, you know, because it's more widely sort of like spoken, it, it's more the norm and, it, you know, it to me, it just felt really accessible. Um and yeah and and I think the fact that the advocates you know when you reach out to them everything's kind of like you know confidential and it, it doesn't go any further so you do have that confidence between that so yeah and and, and do you feel this is one, another one of the questions we've had come in here from your perspective do you feel that female colleagues would have an extra barrier in disclosing about their mental health if their line manager were male So I think, you know, I have um, I thought about this previously, but I think my line manager is a male. Um, and I think when I reflect back, I'm, I'm sure I've probably tested him in so many ways, like, you know, having a young family and having to take some emergency leave and things. But at the end of the day, it's about my needs and what, I need to help me to be the best that I can be. Um, so whilst I think I did worry at the beginning, like, you know, is he going to understand where I'm coming from? Is he going to get what I'm saying to him and 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 that because he doesn't, you know, have like a, a young family of his own or, you know, things, but all that didn't matter. This was about me selfishly. It was about me. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's so important to remember what's at the core of this. Um, Nikki, I didn't know if there was anything that, that you had to add to that one. Um, from a personal perspective, I just wanted to say and, and build on what Nuet said. I've had male managers and female managers as an as a individual myself and going through some of the personal experiences I have, I have never um, stepped back and thought, can I speak to you know a male manager better than a female and I think the reason is because it's the relationship that you fundamentally build with your line manager um and actually I personally found a very powerful support from a previous male line manager and it was because I think we have a perception in our minds that men may not understand some of the issues and things that females go through um, and actually, I, I honestly think that nobody would have given me better support than he did, because male, male line managers, for me, have this sense of pragmatism. They're very pragmatic. And that's what we need to remember is whether it's gender, whether it's culture, whether it's, um, you know, our communities and our backgrounds, we all bring a different perspective. But maybe sometimes the barriers are in our own heads. And what we need to do is we need to overcome the barriers we have a perception that because my line manager is very one and two and three and widgets with me I'm not going to be able to speak to them about something personally but you're probably surprised that it's you putting yourself out there that's what Nuet's done she's she's put herself out there and said well do you know what he needs to deal or she needs to deal with what I'm about to tell them in the way that they best can but they themselves, um, I think in most cases, will probably surprise you. So sometimes maybe the barriers are in our own heads. Yeah, a, a tricky one to, 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 to navigate, isn't it? But I think it's a really important point. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, talking, we're talking here about an organisation that is, is clearly highly performing in terms of the culture that it's building around its, its colleagues in, in Lloyds Banking Group. And we're talking to a, you know, an exemplar line manager here in Nikki and how she's supported New Earth. We've, we've had one question about sort of organisations that are, might be at a slightly different stage of their journey. And um, so if an individual did build up the courage to speak to their manager um, and be honest that they were struggling and the manager responded in a negative or unsupportive way, what advice would you give to that individual as to how to, how to handle that? I think I'll, I'll take that one because I've spoken to a lot of people in that situation when uh, um, I used to work on Rethink's National Advice Line. Um, 
that can be really difficult because you've really opened up vul and, and shown your vulnerability to just feel kind of kicked in the teeth. And I can totally understand how difficult that then, you know, you're already feeling down and, and then that hits you even more. Um, I would first of all recommend, you know, it, are there other line managers in the organisation? Your line managers line manager you know are there other people that you can go and talk to is there a HR department that you can go and talk to um, you know for bigger organizations um, you know you are going to have employee assistance programs and things as well so obviously you can go to those that doesn't always work sadly um, if people are members of unions then union reps can really help with this I know that sometimes union reps get or unions can have a bad um, reputation but you know they're, they're really there to help in situations like this um, and then as well you know if you really feel that you need to you know ringing helplines like Rethink's advice and information service to to kind of look at you know what else can I do here that can that can be really supportive as well but yeah look for other people in the organization HR departments unions um, ACAS as well if it gets to that stage they they can help as well so there's lots of different support out there Fabulous. And I think the one thing that I would add to that as well as sort of responding to the scenario that, that, that you might be dealing with at work is also to make sure that you're putting it yourself first. And, you know, if there's further support that you're, you're needing, then, you know, do reach out to your GP, do reach out to your EAP. There's been a couple of suggestions on the chat around Andy's Man Club. We also at Mental Health UK have an online chat um, forum called uh, Click, which we'll send around the details to as well. So really important to make sure that, um, that you keep your needs at the, the heart of it as well. Um, I've had a couple of quite similar questions here, so hopefully I'll do them both justice by amalgamating together. Um, and this is, I'm going to come to Newet and, and then Nikki on this one. Uh, so since the pandemic, uh, has Lloyds Banking Group given thought to the impact it's had on colleagues' mental health uh, and made allowances uh, for colleagues where they need time off work? And how has workload been picked up? So... I think from my perspective, um, you know, definitely from a, a, a work side of things, I think, you know, Lloyd's is, we, you know, we have open communications um, with colleagues and, you know, we're bringing colleagues along the way in terms of where, you know, that to move into certain new ways of working, like the hybrid model and, you know, in terms of sort of like my own workload that, you know, I think from even taking it back when I first came back, um, following sort of like you know um losing my father that you know nikki's first piece of advice to me was you know don't take on too much just take on what you think you can handle and you know not to feel like you have to rush to you know be back at that you know 100 percent and to me that was like the uh, the soundest advice that i i had because it, you know, not only did it make me feel like it took the pressure off, but it let me set myself my own individual targets in terms of what, what I wanted. And it, eventually I got to a point where I actually wanted more because I felt like I could like deliver more. I think also, I think in terms of like balancing that, you know, we have regular check-ins um, as well with sort of like line managers and, you know, there's an opportunity for us then to, you know, share and talk about, you know, the, the workloads, the pressures and how we feel generally even about coming back into the office and things. So there's, there's you know, we're, we're definitely, I feel like, in the right space. Yeah, I think the, um, I think the pandemic, like with a lot of organisations, just put warp speed on colleague well-being personally talking to family and friends and kind of if without trying to you just compare experiences that people are having in their workplaces um, at that time and actually I was fundamentally just so impressed with Lloyd's Banking Group's call to action um, again, you know, as somebody who's so passionate about well-being and mental health agenda, I was just so impressed with all of the things that were put in place for colleagues so quickly and so fundamentally. But then I also appreciate that there are a lot of organisations um, that I knew from family and friends that that weren't as quick. You know, so Lloyd's kind of was up there and and, and really kind of driving the, the you know driving the seat from there. But actually, um, as the pandemic's gone on, that that whole um, strategy and that whole support network has been tested on multiple times. You know, we've gone from 
the summer when the pandemic first started and everybody kind of took their laptops outside and you kind of had this wonderful vitamin D just soaking in while you're working versus the winter months that we're now in, you know, and, and the challenges just become so differently. And I think what it's done is it's made us all realise that individually we're all having our own experiences with the pandemic. We're all kind of going through our own thing. I think um, productivity has become very different for all organisations. And in Lloyd's, I think that's been realised as well, finding different ways to work. But there, there's a pendulum here, isn't there? There's a balance. And whilst we have enabled colleagues to be safe at home under the government guidelines in the early days, we're now in this kind of opening the world back up and a bit of anxiety and a bit of kind of um, nervousness opening up about what our future way of working is going to be. And I know, again, that's, that's kind of across lots of different organisations. So it's really interesting at the moment to see how we, as a, as a Lloyds Banking Group, are responding to that and how we're redefining the support that we need to have for colleagues to, to do that. And that that's obviously something that, again, Nuet and I are, are very kind of passionate about contributing into. I think the concept of colleagues being able to take time for their well-being and take time out, the example that Nuet gave there, or just child caring responsibilities, you know, family caring responsibilities. We've all had to adapt. Every single person has had to adapt. And I think that in Lloyd's Banking Group, and I hope in other organisations as well, I think that we've learnt the art of flexibility. We've, we've learnt the art of adaptability to get the work done. But fundamentally, nothing really broke, did it? So <laughs> I'm probably going to get called out on that. But Fundamentally, you know, that the, there's a perception of the way that we feel like we need to do our nine to five hours, the things that we need to deliver in that nine to five versus balancing your well-being. Now, I think before the pandemic, we literally focused on the nine to five agenda. What do I need to get delivered in that nine to five? The pandemic went, hold on a sec, what about you? What do you need? And how do you now balance your time and your life and your commitments around work being part of those? So I think it's a really interesting time for us to take that learning into this new world now that we're going to emerge out of. I think it's very, very interesting. And, and there's just still so much for us to be for us to be learning and to dealing with, deal with. And I think that that will go on absolutely for quite some time. Um, just got two more questions, Emma. That, that they both look like they're for, probably for you. Um, first, first one is um, back to back to the subject of men and talking about mental health. The question says, I think a lot of men, especially working in male-dominated industries, believe that they have uh, have to look powerful and strong and present uh, present the image that they uh, don't experience mental health problems themselves. I think it's this perception that puts other men off from opening up and feeling like they're renouncing some of their validity or credibility at work. How can we count, counter this? Oh, goodness, we could spend hours talking about that on its, on its own, couldn't we? Um, I think that it, it comes down to conversations. It comes down to, um, you know, men trying to talk to each other and actually us as women, partners, sisters, friends, um, encouraging them to open up. Um, and having that conversation, and it sounds really trite when I say it, but the fact that actually the strongest men are the ones that can open up about their about their emotions and actually talk to other men about that. Um, I, I saw in the chat earlier that somebody was talking about how um, men can often feel that it's easier to talk if they're doing something. Um, and that has, I mean, there's, there's all sorts of groups out there that show that that works. And I know I, I used to work for Cruise Bereavement Care, who were an awesome charity dealing with um, bereavement. Um, and um, we used to have a group for um, uh, male su male survivors of bereavement um, and they would kind of come along and it, it wasn't you didn't talk about bereavement you kind of talked about everything else but then that would come in because at the end of the day when you've got a load of human beings in a room they're going to start talking about things that matter to them um, so I think that groups like that can be really really helpful but I think it is just about having those human to human conversations all the time um, and maybe I guess um, trying to put myself in the shoes of a man um, I think that it might help to um, you know find those friends male or female that you know are more open to these kind of conversations practice those conversations with those people first 
Um, don't go to that friend that you know is going to put, put you down because that's going to knock your confidence low. So find those people that you know are going to listen and start those conversations. And I genuinely think with most things that we find that the more we start to talk about things, the more the stigma is broken down. And um, so just talk, talk, talk is, is my is my advice there. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. And the last one, does Mental Health UK offer training for managers in the workplace? And what other supports does Mental Health UK have that they can offer to businesses to help develop their culture? Yes, we do offer training for line managers in the workplace. Um, and I think we could probably put something on the um, in the links, couldn't we, Katie? Um, so we, we can and, and certainly kind of speaking to um, line managers that have been on that training, they found that really useful. So that's that's the first thing. Yes, we do. Um, and the training team are brilliant and really approachable. So I'd really recommend people to to get them involved. Um, I've already mentioned the conversation guide that's on the um, website. Alongside that, we have um, something called the stress bucket. Um, which is probably kind of a preventative, I always find that word difficult to say, preventative um, tool um, where if we start to feel that we're, our well-being is being affected, um, the stress bucket can kind of help you look at actually what do I need to put in place to kind of help myself. Um, and kind of sitting alongside that, we have um, also on the website um, the Mental Health UK Wellbeing Plan, um, I'm a massive, massive advocate of these. They're, they're, it's a proactive tool. Um, and um, what you can do on it, it basically kind of goes through, you know, what does well-being look like for me? How do I know when things are going well? How do I know when things are getting a bit tricky? What support is there for me? Um, and I'm a, what I always say to people when I'm working with them is, line managers should be the ones filling this in as well like often colleagues feel that they're told that they've got to do something to help their well-being when actually if line managers can show these are the struggles that I'm facing exactly what Nikki and Nuyet have been talking about this is what um, I do when I'm feeling stressed these are the um, behaviors that I exhibit you know when, when my well-being is kind of un, under attack a little bit and by a line manager showing that to their colleagues, you're opening up that conversation. So it's very much a two way thing. So um, I'm a big fan of those wellbeing plans. So I'd suggest going and having a look at those. Brilliant. Well, we will make a point of, of sending around the links to all of those. But I would say to anybody who's uh, who's listening today that um, if you want to start your journey uh, for workplace mental health or indeed you're on your journey and want to go know where to go next, then just drop the partnerships team an email and um, and we'll very, very happily have a chat with you. We'll give you our contact details away as well. Um, so I think really this just leaves me um, with the need to say a huge thank you and congratulations first to New York for so inspiringly and succinctly sharing with everybody today your story it's um you know quite a journey that you've gone on and and, and we, we've spoken a couple of times this week and um i think i think it's it, it really is truly inspirational to me and as we've seen from the from the chat here um equally to, to many other people who've been listening um equally to yourself mickey you, you've talked about your own mental health and well-being and also talked about how how you supported in the workplace with them um, with new Edge journey and i think that there's a lot that people will take away from today and hopefully try and, and emulate in their own work environment and Emma constant voice of reason and expert um, uh, advice that you've handed over to everybody today it's been probably one of the sessions that I've enjoyed um, delivering the most and, and I think you know off of the back of this for everybody who's listening in we would ask um, just two things of you all firstly is to reflect on what you've heard today very very inspiring conversation and think about how you can apply that not just in your workplace and with your line managers and with your direct reports as we've heard but we're all human beings this is how we apply the learning um, consistently across our lives but secondly we would ask um, for you to share this webinar with just at least one other person um, because uh, it, it might give the opportunity for other people to, to develop in very similar ways or indeed open up about their own mental health. Um, we have one more webinar 
this year before we we knock off for Christmas and that's going to be on the 10th of December where we'll be talking about how to identify the signs of loneliness and how to support colleagues with that and I'll be joined by Judith Major who is the Promise National Coordinator um, working with us in Wales um, and another guest who will be joining us and will be announcing in the not too distant future. I think one of the things about loneliness is to believe that or have the perception that because we're now not in lockdown and we're we're out of the hard part of the pandemic that loneliness isn't something that exists anymore or not to the same level or indeed because somebody's presenting a very confident face at work is uh is is a sign that they're not experiencing uh loneliness in other parts of their life and that's simply not true so that's what we'll be talking about demystifying and hopefully giving everybody some great advice and tips so thank you again to everybody who's joined us today thank you to everyone who's listening in and we'll see you again in a month's time take care <laughs>